Thank you, worship team. Good morning, church. Just a thought here this morning as um, we think about all that we're doing. Oh, Biagio was asking for junior church guys, you little guys that are ready to go to junior church. Thank you, Biagio. Just a thought this morning as uh, the girls are up here playing. I often in my mind try to imagine what it must have been like for the Hebrews in the wilderness to be standing around the tabernacle, bringing their sacrifices and bringing their offerings before the Lord. And you know, there was no PowerPoint there was no band. You know, there were the musicians, of course, those that played songs, and they certainly sang of the Psalms. But you just have to believe that it was just real life, just living there in the wilderness day after day after day and offering their sacrifices and coming and just praying that the Lord would forgive them. And uh, I just like thinking about that sometimes. Sometimes I believe we get so caught up in the way things ought to be and the professionalism of things that... Uh, we just forget that we're just people that have uh, just a need to worship the Lord. And so I uh, thank you girls for doing what you've doing, done these last couple of weeks. Thank you for the team. Thank you all for what you do, uh, that we can just be a, a body of believers that just believe in, in worship and celebrating the resurrection, just live in real life. Amen? It's good. It's really good. Just a quick update on Anna, no passport yet, so continue to pray, and uh, we'll just unfold this as God allows it to be unfolded for us. So we're just uh, moving on with all of that. And an <clears throat> interesting opportunity yesterday, first time I'd been back to visit my mom's grave. Uh, this past weekend I was out of town doing our nieces, we were at our niece's uh, wedding, and I got to officiate that, and that was uh, fun, it was bittersweet, and it was exciting for, for them, to, for, uh, she, for her and her new husband. Uh, but then just going to the grave with that, it was a little bit sad for me all over again. And just looking, the flowers have now died. And, and so I said to Dad, I said, we need to just pull these off of here and, and uh, freshen this up just a little bit. And the question began to come to my mind. is that Lord, what are, what are we really doing? Uh, why are we doing all of this? What is it that you really want from us? And uh, I was reminded of the scriptures as the Spirit began to speak to my heart and remind me of the truth I just want to share with you three verses that came to my mind, and that is John 3.15. John simply wrote here, so that whoever believes in him will have eternal life. And then I was taken to 1 John 5.13. These things I've written to you that who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. John 20. Many other signs Jesus performed in the presence of the disciples which are not written in the book, but these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. I just can't tell you again, I know many of you have been in the same place before, but just going to the grave there of mom and just being so thankful for eternal life. Just thankful that she is not there, uh, that she is with God, and what a blessing. What a blessing. Folks, we're here because the Lord has offered to us eternal life. And so we study this book because it is the word of life and the words of life for us. And so I hope you never grow tired of that. I hope you come anxious. I hope you come excited and longing to listen to what the Lord has to say to us. He loves us, doesn't he? Amen. And he's done much to provide for us everything that we need in this life and the life to come. And so let's, let's look into his word this morning now. Uh, go with me in prayer, if you will, and then we're going to stand together and look at the text. Father, uh, as we've already celebrated this morning, we celebrate again life uh, because you have given to us life, not just physical life, but you've given to us eternal life, heart-filled life, the joy that only you can pour out into our souls. And so we come as a family of believers celebrating you today in worshiping you. We thank you for the songs. We thank you for the girls and the worship team. We thank you for everyone who has a part in making the mornings happen on Sundays. And so, Lord, we just pause now to thank you and to praise you and to worship you. So feed us as we honor you with our lives and as we stand in honor of your word that you may be glorified. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So stand with me this morning as we jump into part two of what we started last week. The final worldwide divine wrath unleashed. Okay, we're going to pick up in verse 8 of Revelation chapter 16 and read through the rest of the chapter. 
And the fourth angel poured out his bowl upon the sun, and it was given to it to scorch men with fire. Men were scorched with fierce heat, and they blasphemed the name of God who has the power over the plagues, and they did not repent so as to give him glory. And then the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and his kingdom became darkened. And they gnawed their tongues because of pain. And they blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, and they did not repent of their deeds. And the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river, the Euphrates, and its water was dried up so that the way would be prepared for the kings from the east. And I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet three unclean spirits like frogs, for they are spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the whole world to gather them together for the war of the great day of God, the Almighty. Behold, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake and keeps his clothes so that he will not walk about naked and men will not see his shame. And they gathered them together to the place which in Hebrew is called Har Mageddon. And then the seventh angel poured out his bowl upon the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple from the throne, saying, It is done. And there were flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder, and there was a great earthquake, such as there has not been since man came to be upon the earth. So great an earthquake was it, and so mighty. The great city was split into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. Babylon the Great was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of his fierce wrath, and every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. And huge hailstones, about 100 pounds each, came down from heaven upon men, and men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, because its plague was extremely severe. Praise the Lord. You may be seated. <clears throat> Again, please uh, look at the back of your bulletin for a uh, review. It's a little bit detailed, and so I just want you to have that available to you. Just by way of reminder from last week, we saw in verses 5 through 8 the retribution of God being poured out upon the ungodly, and that's where we are today, finishing up that. Uh, we saw where the angels were being made ready for battle. They were given uh, not only the plagues earlier in the chapter, but the bowls to pour out these plagues. And then we realized that heaven was on lockdown, God had removed everyone from heaven so that he could finish his judgments. And then he gave the command to go in verse 1 of chapter 16 and then began to pour out these judgments. And we got through three of those. first one was the worldwide sores that were poured out on the bodies of the people of the ungodly during those days. And then the worldwide flood of blood, if you remember, which would cause untold damage. And then we had this little interlude there in verses 5 through 7 of God's response to the question, basically, of why are you doing this, God? Who are you? Who do you think you are, basically, to be able to do these kind of judgments? And the angel was used by God to give the response because the ungodly have been just that. They have rejected the message of the Lord, and they deserve the punishment that the holy, righteous God is to give to them. And that's where we stopped, and so today we want to conclude these bowls, if you will, in the rest of the chapter beginning in verse 8. And so let's read that again now as we look specifically at this fourth bowl. And so John writes, this fourth angel poured out his bowl upon the sun and it was given to scorch men with fire. Men were scorched with fierce heat, according to verse 9. So what we see here is, again, God overruling the effects of nature that he himself has put in place. This time, affecting the very solar system itself, the sun, causing the sun to penetrate to the earth to the point where this scorching heat from the sun would literally burn men from it and by it. And you have to think about this a little bit and understand that what God intended originally way back in his creation for the blessing of man has now become the tool in his hand to judge those same ungodly people. You know, you think about those nice warm days where you go out and it's been cold out and the sun comes out and you feel, oh, that feels so good. What a wonderful blessing that God has provided for us in the warmth of, warmth of the sun. But now, according to this particular plague, that very thing, that object, becomes the killer of man, a tool in the hand of God to terrorize man through the forces of nature. In fact, it's interesting, Isaiah wrote about this very thing happening way back in his prophecy in chapter 24 of his letter. He said this, the earth mourns and withers, 
the world fades and withers, and exalted, excuse me, the exalted of the people of the earth fade away, the earth is also polluted by its inhabitants, for they transgressed laws, violated statutes, broke the everlasting covenant. Therefore a curse devours the earth, and those who live in it are held guilty. Therefore the inhabitants of the earth are burned. Do you hear that? And few men are left. By the way, you ought to mark in your Bible that verse because that is a great verse to be using for people that don't understand why the church wants to proclaim these judgments. You know, often the church has been ridiculed over the years as to why it wants to be a message of doom and gloom. Well, here God himself gives thousands of years ago the reason why, in a very quick summary, that he will do such things. The world is polluted by its inhabitants. The earth needs to know that, right? I mean, let's just remember that there is no good news of the gospel. The gospel means nothing if there is not first bad news and why God must bring the grace and mercy of salvation. For the world has transgressed the laws, violated God's statutes, broken the everlasting covenant. If you understand spiritually the truth of these things, you understand there in verse 6 of Isaiah, therefore a curse devours the earth. I was just sharing with somebody just the other day the whole problem with the planet, that we are under the curse of God. This world is literally cursed by God. And here we have a beautiful summary of that in Isaiah. Now, if you think with me again, back to our text here, at this point in the tribulation, millions of people have died. The world is literally uh, overwhelmed with the death of people. One commentator wrote this, and I thought it was good for us to just think through the technical part of all of what's happening. He said, another serious consequence of the sun's intense heat will be the melting of the polar ice caps. The resulting rise in the ocean's water level will inundate coastal regions flooding areas miles inland with the noxious waters of the dead oceans. Widespread damage and loss of life will accompany that flooding, adding further to the unspeakable misery of the devastated planet. And transportation by sea will become impossible. That's what the world is going to be looking like. And we don't really think about those details until someone brings them out for us. But to think of all of the ice around the world, the glaciers and everything now that have turned to blood and melted into this giant cesspool of uh, the ocean that is now uh, muddied with the blood of, of living life and, and all the fresh water. And you would think, wouldn't you, just logic would tell you that the world, anybody in their right mind would cry out for help during those days. And they would cry out to the very God that can help them, but the opposite occurs. Look at verse 9 again. And they blaspheme the name of God the very one who has the power over these plagues. I mean, think about that. The very God who has the ability to change all of this is the one that they curse. Absolutely staggering. John goes on to say, they did not repent so as to give him glory. In other words, very clearly, the hearts of the people were so hardened from sin, they reject the only one that can save them. Folks, now think about that. The only one that can save you and me is the Lord himself. Amen? Amen. He is the one who pro pronounces judgment on the ungodly, but we were the ungodly who first didn't know of the resurrection power of Christ and the salvation that comes through his name. He also is the one that's provided life for us. How foolish would it be to reject the very one that can save us? But amazingly, as the text tells us, the world is going to follow their leader, and this becomes clear as to why they do it, because they are duped by the Antichrist. They have at this time now evidently taken, taken on his nature. They have become a part of him and his belief system as he has been in leadership now. His personality, no doubt, has begun to influence people in a dramatic way. His arrogance towards God and all that God stands for in his righteousness it's really hard to believe when you think about that as well that someone could be so influenced by someone else. But we do the same thing, don't we? I mean, aren't we influenced by other people? I mean, all of us have heroes in our lives, right? And one of the things I love to joke with these young people about at the gym is that they'll do these massive weight lift things and, and I'll go up to them and I'll say, man, you're my hero now. And the next guy lifts something better and I say, oh, you're my hero now. You know, I just like messing with them a little bit. 
But we do that in a lot of different ways. And so maybe it's hard to believe this could be happening and the people would be following a leader like this, but have you ever heard the phrase, you become who you associate with? It's really a true statement, isn't it? We are greatly influenced by the people that we look up to. I know in my life as a young pastor, I have looked up to men that have been pastors in the pulpit greatly over the years and in many ways emulated them. And it's hard not to do that. You look at someone that's had a great influence in your life and it's, it's tra very difficult not to do that. But business people do the same thing. You know, a young man or woman who's aspiring to be an attorney or a business person, some entrepreneur will look to somebody who's been successful and they will begin to emulate their lives and the way that they conduct themselves and even taking on their personalities at times. Singers will do this. Writers will do this. Uh, athletes will do this. Uh, back to the thought about the church, I was having a conversation with uh, a guy who's been in ministry for a lot of years, not as the senior pastor, but as uh, one of the other pastors, and he was serving under a man who he really didn't understand well uh, until after the senior pastor was gone. This was some years ago. And I remember having the conversation with him, and he looked at me and he says, Bruce, I have to tell you this in response to the life that I've lived here as one of the staff pastors. He said, I realized that we were taught to hate. And I said, what do you mean by that? I said, that's a pretty strong language. I'm talking about pastors? He says, yeah. He says, we were being tutored to only accept people in a certain way, to not really open our hearts fully in grace and mercy, to love people in spite of their faults. But we were being taught a path that we should walk on that I didn't realize until after it was all said and done. And I thought, how tragic is that? But it happens, doesn't it? Uh, one of the people that is a hero of mine in the sports world is Tony Bennett, our own coach here at UVA. Uh, Tony would be the first guy to tell you he's not perfect, but he's uh, a man who desires to follow after God. And uh, it's easy to watch a man like that who knows so much about basketball. If you're not a basketball fan, uh, just indulge me here for just a second. Uh, but... Here's a guy who has promoted his belief system of God into the players. And you can watch them, how they react on the court. You can see his influence in their lives of, of this effect of godliness and the way they respond and how careful they are to do what they do. And I know this firsthand from a friend of mine who's a good friend of Tony's, and so I have it on firsthand knowledge. But um, also the same is true as we were at a basketball game uh, not long ago, and, and I told Debbie, I said, you can watch the effects of players by the coach and how they respond. You ever seen a team that will react negatively and violently to the officials and, and whatnot? Well, it doesn't take long to look over at the bench and see the coach being the lead in all of that, kicking chairs and throwing stuff and players just become a part of all of that. And so I guess my simple point is, is that it's not so hard to believe that in a darkened world that has become so spiritually blinded, the people would begin to take on the same personality and following their leader, the Antichrist, at this point. And so you begin to understand a little bit better where the world is at this point. I guess my thought in all of that would be if you want to be the kind of person who is leading others into godly lives, and guess where it has to start, Right? has to start with your example. I told my cousin yesterday at, a, at, a, at the wedding reception, she has three little girls, and uh, I told her, I said, Jenny, you're doing a good job with your daughters. And she just kind of laughed, and I said, you're, they're so calm. And uh, if you know Jenny from years ago, she was not calm. Uh, had a lot of energy, but uh, now she's doing a great job as a mom. And I just was sharing to her, I said, the girls are living under you now, and they're seeing how you're living, and they're becoming a part of that calmness, and so it's, it's wonderful. But if you want to be a person who exemplifies humility and, and godliness and patience and those things of the fruits of the Spirit, then uh, you need to live those in front of others so that they will follow your lead. Let's keep going here now. Look at verse 10 because there's another plague, worldwide darkness. So the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and his kingdom became darkened. So God darkens the world of the Antichrist. What, he's really, what is he really talking about here? Well, I think this is a literal thing, that God is literally going to darken the whole earth. And it takes me back in my mind to just as God, as we've seen last week, how he was using an example of the plagues on Egypt. 
which were really, by the way, a foreshadowing of the end plagues coming. You understand that now, don't you? That those things that happened to the Hebrews was really just God's way of saying, this is a small sample of what eventually will come one day. And so we go back to those times and we see that as the sun was hidden from Egypt, you remember the plague? So will the earth during this time. <clears throat> and the indication is, it's not going to be just a darkening of the earth. It was interesting, we had a couple visiting with us this morning from the early service and I talked to them right afterwards and they have both been stationed in Alaska for the last three years. And so they really identified with this part here and they said that um, in Alaska, it just throws you off all over the place because the sun is kind of sorted down. She actually showed me a picture of a photographer's rendition of the sun in various spots at certain times of the year. And it'll kind of just barely dip below the mountain and come right back up. Those of you who've been to Alaska and live there, you understand that kind of thing. It really, really throws your whole system out of whack. Well, the indication here is it's not going to be a partial darkness, but this is going to be a total darkness a pitch black darkness. You say, how do you get that? Well, let's go back to Exodus. <clears throat> Excuse me, Exodus chapter 10, verse 21. The Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand toward the sky that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, even a darkness which may be felt. And what does that mean? So Moses stretched out his hand toward the sky and there was thick darkness in all the land of Egypt for three days. Notice this, they did not see one another nor did anyone rise from his place for three days. But I love this. But all the sons of Israel had light in their dwellings. Isn't that awesome? God is so good, isn't he? Except for God's people, the entire region of the Egyptian world was in utter and total darkness. And we have to believe now, as that is an example, that just like it was for the Hebrews, the faithful of God are going to be kept from the darkness during this time as well that God will preserve his faithful ones, giving them light. Just a little bit of an interesting side note, if you've ever done any study on the plagues, you know that those were direct attacks against the gods of the Egyptians. This one in particular was against the god of Ra, the sun god. But here what we have is this picture of the god uh, Antichrist, whom this will be against. And so this is going to be a huge affront to him, who again, by this time, the people are all rushing to as their leader. You're the one who has the answers. You're God, right? He's caused them to worship him now. And so this will be a huge affront to him and his power as God takes over the forces of nature. Now, just in my mind now, as we dwell on that for just another moment, can you imagine a place of total darkness? A world of total darkness? I mean, it's horrible for a person, and they may not think so, but it's terrible for a person, at least for those of us who have vision, to, not, to have the thought of not being able to see. It's one thing, though, for a person or a group of people to not be able to see. Can you imagine the entire world not being able to see? It's really mind-boggling when you think about it. But now add to that the things that go on in the darkness, the crime, the fear that will come as a result of not knowing who's outside your door. Because there will be those wicked ones that go out doing all that they can in order to rob and steal and cause harm. It's what happens in the darkness, right? There's going to be all kinds of things that are going to be happening. You say, well, that's not such a big deal. I mean, way back then, they may have had the, the camel oil lamps or whatever it was, right? We have generators today. Now, just think with me for a second. Now, if the sun is darkened, it doesn't take long before there is no source for batteries anymore. There's no source for solar power. Candles will eventually burn out. Gas cannot be pumped out of the ground. And so generators won't be able to run. So what do you do? Well, you turn in fear. Right? That's the whole point. Now, sadly, what turned the heart of Pharaoh, though, and you remember that's what happened. God used these plagues to turn his heart. In this case, that's not going to happen. Their hearts will not turn. Notice what they do. They gnawed their tongues because of the pain, in verse 10. And they blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, and they did not repent of their deeds. Now, what's this idea of gnawing the tongues? That's kind of a weird thing here. Well, it's simply, it's like saying they chewed their tongues. That's a strange kind of a thing for me to think about, but I was reading some things this week about how extreme pain and extreme difficulties when people are in greatly stressful situations will do that kind of thing. They just kind of bite down on their tongue and begin to chew on it. 
And that's painful. Can you imagine? Try it right now. Just go ahead and just clamp down on your tongue. Uh, you've done that before, right? You've been eating a good piece of steak and all this, oh man, bit the inside of your tongue or your cheek or something like that. And it's excruciating, isn't it? Well, here what we're told is that these people, because of the pain, it's going to be evidently more, I, I, almost like a healing kind of a thing, you know? It's, it's like my, my mom used to tell me before that, you know, if when it's time to pull the tooth out of the child's mouth, if you hit them on the head real hard, they'll be more concerned about the headache than they will be the toothache. I think it's the same kind of thing here, you know? You just pop them out, they don't feel the tooth being pulled out. It's, it's almost like that. It's better. It's almost like this soothing effect. I'll gnaw on my tongue to forget all the pains. Is the only indication that we really can get from any of this. And to think the gnawing is caused by all of that. The sores, the darkness. You know, one of the things that's true of all humans, and this comes really right out of Genesis chapter 2, where God said it's not good for man to be alone. Isolation is one of the worst forms of treatment that anybody can experience. Now, I know some of us all say, well, I kind of like my quiet times, my times alone. That's true, but we don't like to be totally isolated forever, do we? I mean, that's why we live in communities. That's why we live in places where there's somebody close. That's why solitary confinement is so effective. In fact, this young man was saying to me this morning, he says, yeah, I can really identify with that. Being in Alaska with this changing of the sun brings all kinds of weird kind of moods. He said over the last three years, it was like you'd just be depressed for kind of apparently no reason. It's just the darkness all the time. So imagine these people now being in this total darkness that Exodus said could be felt, whatever that is like, not able to see anything, and everybody experiencing the same thing, not just localized, but across the world, the entire world going through all of this. You talk about going crazy. In fact, the Science Explorer had an article that said this. It's lengthy. It has some other studies in here of people who were put in total darkness uh, for a period of time. Listen to what one article says or what one uh, test came up with. It says, since this type of sensory deprivation is often used as a torture technique during wartime, a British study locked up six volunteers in dark, solitary confinement for 48 hours to test its effects. According to the Daily Mail, which is a local thing, I guess, Adam Bloom, an extroverted stand-up comic, fared particularly terribly. He says at one point he started singing and then suddenly burst into tears, feeling as if his emotions were running out of control. And then I found myself suspecting the whole experience, experiment was a trick. How did I know these people were really who they said they were? What if they'd gone home and I was trapped down here forever, he started thinking. And he says the utter, the utter darkness caused him to completely lose his sense of time. He dozed off and then would wake up not knowing whether it was night or day, and even meals didn't help restore a feeling of normalcy. In fact, he and some of the other volunteers actually started hallucinating. A heap of 500 oysters, tiny cars, snakes, zebras, fighter planes, mosquitoes, and even the sensation of the room taking off. The article says the bottom line is humans need light and interaction to stay sane. Without light, we lose our sense of time, and without interaction, we become consumed with loneliness and boredom. With this sensory deprivation comes the strangest, most unimaginable psychological effects. You can imagine, right? Or maybe we can't imagine what that's going to be like, but we should try. Well, God brings even greater judgment because these people will not repent from all the things that are occurring, and so God keeps pressing the issue. This changes just a little bit here from what we've seen in the past. This plague is slightly different and may seem a little bit confusing for you at first, but I think once we explain it, it'll be more clear for you. Look at verse 12. This gathering of the world's armies. The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river, the Euphrates, and it was dried up so that the way would be prepared for the kings from the east. Now, this bowl, you need to understand, is not a plague specifically and directly on humanity but it is a judgment through a coming battle, the time that the scriptures have foretold. But this battle is going to be like no other battle that there ever has been. And to instigate this whole thing, the angel, according to God's command, pours out his bowl on the great river Euphrates. 
to get the whole thing rolling. Now we have to do something with these words here. This word great is used because it is a great river. It stretches over 1,800 miles, all the way from the highest point of Mount Ararat, which is in Turkey, all the way down to the Persian Gulf. And that's, uh, you, those of you who have been there, that part of the world, know that's a long distance. And so this is a huge river. And you'll remember as John sees this particular bowl, bowl uh, poured out, we have to remember too that the water is blood now. So this river is flowing with blood. The ice caps have melted on Mount Ararat and no, no doubt engulfing the entire region down below with blood creating all kinds of flood problems and damages to the bridges and the roads that could be used to be crossed over. And so the only way God can get this next judgment to happen is he has to cause something in the river to occur. And so he dries it up, allowing these kings, we're told, to come over from the east. Again, this is not an act of kindness on God's part. This is an act of his judgment to take care of, now think with me clearly, so that these deadly armies that are going to be coming against his people will be trapped in a place that we're going to see in just a moment. Very similar, though, to how God would part the waters in salvation for the Hebrews, but yet trap Pharaoh and his armies would be drowned. So it was deadly for Pharaoh. It's going to be deadly for these kings of the world coming against Israel. So we have to ask, though, why are they going to be advancing, though? What is it that's going to be causing these kings to want to advance against Israel? What's going to do that? What's going to convince them to do that? Well, there's some speculations. Maybe it's because now that they are so influenced by the Antichrist, they're hearing of the revival going on in Jerusalem, the people who are being preserved through all of this, and so they want to march on them in the favor of the Antichrist. In other words, they're coming to sort of rescue, come to the help of the aid of the Antichrist. All through everything, imagine this pilgrimage for them, the darkness, the scorching heat, the sores on their bodies, the drought. But the reality is we don't really know what they're being purposeful, purposefully coming for other than what God tells us here. Look with me in verse 13, and this will give us much more clarity. And I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon... Out of the mouth of the beast and the mouth of the false prophet, you understand that is the ungodly imitation of the Trinity, right? That's Satan, the Antichrist, and the false prophet. John says he saw what looks like three unclean spirits like frogs. Then he says, for they are the spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the whole world to gather them together for the war of the great day of God the Almighty. Right there we have really the reason that these kings are coming. They're deceived. They're deceived by the demonic work of this unholy trinity. And notice this word mouth here. Three times in respect to each of these uh, people, or these, I shouldn't say people, these uh, demonic beings, Satan himself, the false prophet, and the Antichrist, John says that out of their mouths comes this message of deception. Must be some kind of enticing words, no doubt. The Antichrist, we already know, has the ability to do that to influence people that way, some kind of propaganda that would encourage them to come. And you say, well, I still just don't get it. I don't understand how somebody could be so enticing that way. How could that, that be so influencing? Well, we have to stay on the same track and realize that there have been numerous people, even nations that have already in our history past, that have been influenced by propaganda, not to mention Hitler himself. Let me read to you a portion of his speech from April 28, 1939. In quote, I overcame chaos in Germany, Hitler said, restored order, enormously raised production in all fields of our national economy. I succeeded in completely resettling in useful production those seven million unemployed who so touched our hearts. I have not only politically united the German nation, but also rearmed it militarily. And I have further tried to liquidate the treaty sheet by sheet whose 448 articles contain the vilest rape that nations and human beings have ever been expected to submit to. He's talking about the Versailles Treaty. I have restored to the Reich the provinces grabbed from us in 1919. I have led millions of deeply unhappy Germans who have been snatched away from us back into the fatherland. I have restored the thousand-year-old historical unity of Germany living space. 
And I have attempted to accomplish all that without shedding blood and without inflicting the sufferings of war on my people or any other. I have accomplished all this as one who 21 years ago was still an unknown worker and soldier of my people by my own efforts. Now, folks, listen. If you're living in Germany at the time and somebody comes and starts promoting what they have done and you're looking back and saying, yeah, that's true, yeah, that's true, yeah, that's true. Can't argue with that. Yeah, that's true. He must be the guy. Well, that's the same thing Antichrist has been doing all this time during the tribulation, right? And so these world leaders are going to buy all of this through their propaganda and come and do what he wants them to do. And they have this appearance, we're told, that look like frogs. And you say, what's this all about? Why do they look like frogs? Notice it says like frogs, so they're not exactly frogs. But you just need to understand that this would be very effective from a demonic perspective because a frog was an unclean animal to the Jewish people. If you look back in the text of Scripture, you'll see where frogs are unclean. And so they would understand this picture would be an unclean situation here, helping to see the demonic influence that is being brought about by all this, and not to mention the propaganda, as I said. Notice here we're told that they are able to perform signs. And these signs, John says, go out to all the kings of the world. These are incredible things. Notice, which cause them to gather for war. But not against God. Excuse me. Against God, not against man. In other words, in their minds, I have to believe that these kings are going to be thinking that they're coming to follow their leader, Antichrist, to go against men. To go, go against people. But the reality is in this, remember, this is a judgment from God. God is the one behind all of this, gathering these people unbeknown to them, using Satan and the false prophet and the Antichrist to bring them to a place where he will destroy them. You can imagine in the mind of these kings, they're thinking, this is going to be a cakewalk. This is not going to be any big deal at all. We're going to march right over there, and we're going to take care of this. I mean, even coming to the point of the Euphrates River and they say, oh man, this is going to be terrible. How are we going to get across? And all of a sudden it dries up and they're able to march across? Well, they're not going to give credit to God. They're going to be thinking that this is all happening so that they can go defeat these Hebrews or these Christians, if you will. And further, they must be thinking, who's going to go against this? I mean, this Antichrist, this guy, he's our leader. Not to mention all of us in the entire world are coming against these people. This is going to be a piece of cake, but they're going to find out differently very soon, of which we'll get to. And, by the way, who is the one setting all this up? It's going to become very clear for them. Notice in verse 15, we have just a little parenthetical statement here from the Lord, just kind of inserting this little footnote for us as the church, reminding us, of who's behind all this. Behold, you almost hear him saying to the church here, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake and keeps his clothes so that he will not walk about naked and men will not see his shame. We say, well, who's speaking here? Well, those are the same type of words that the Lord used to the church at Sardis. I won't take the time to read that, but in Revelation 3, we see his wording there very similar. I will come like a thief, and you'll not know what hour I come to you. He's saying that to the church. In other words, be awake. Keep yourself fully dressed. He would say the same thing to the church in Laodicea in chapter 3. And so obviously this must be Jesus. And I love this, how he is so true to himself. Notice he's saying here in this wonderful word of encouragement, stay awake. Stay awake. Don't go to sleep. Be on the alert because I come like a thief. I'll come without warning. I'm not going to tell you. I'm not going to tell you when this is coming. But my purpose will be to take back all that belongs to me. And what a blessing it is, as he said, keep your clothes on. Again, it's all about preparation. So you're not caught off guard. And I was thinking like a soldier. You know, one of the epitomes of uh, righteous character has been the, the look of a soldier or a police officer dressed in uniform and how they take that so seriously and they're commanded to stay at their post and if they don't stay at their post they're going to be disciplined for it and they're not a good soldier if they don't stay at their post and so the Lord's imagery here is of a soldier on the lookout for his commander's return 
Surely he's coming today. Surely he's coming today. Always looking, always watching, always being ready, fully prepared, anticipating the commander's return, the one who is in charge of all of this, so that there will be the day of reward when he comes back and he finds me, waiting for him as he comes. And beloved, can I just say to you, just as a little footnote here, I hope that's your heart. That as we're seeing here this command from Jesus to the people of that day, that we find ourselves right on the edge of our seats, just waiting and hoping and longing for the coming of the Lord. I hope that's you. Look at verse 16. The text goes on to tell us, not only are they going to cross over, but they're going to gather together in the place which is called in Hebrew, Har Megiddon. Now that's a Hebrew word, but in English it would be Mount Megiddo. We touched on this a little bit before, but interestingly, there's no specific mountain in Palestine by that name. The word Har in Hebrew can refer really to any hill country, but specifically we're told this Megiddo or this Megiddon is, we know, a hill country around Jerusalem, about 60 miles north of Jerusalem. And so this is the place that most theologians believe that God is talking about here. In fact, it's been throughout history used as a battlefield. In Isaiah 63, Isaiah says the battle will be over this Megiddo and the valley of Jezreel. It's basically the same place. In fact, I want to show you just a picture here. If we can pull that map up just for a second, um, I hope you can see, I don't have my pointer up here, but if you can see the red outline there, it's kind of a box-like long, elongated kind of a thing. Megiddo is the little red dot. Let me just grab my pointer here so you can see it. This is the region we're talking about here. Here's Megiddo. This is the Mediterranean. This is the Sea of Galilee, the Dead Sea here, the mountain range. This is the plain regions. This is the Valley of Jezreel. You can see it right here listed. And so what the area we're talking about is basically right through here. All of this is known as the, in kind of a common man's way, the plain of Jezreel or the Valley of Jezreel. This is the region that's being talked about here. And Isaiah talks about that. The word Jezreel, just to give you an idea of it, is literally means God sows, like fertile, like garden. So it's a place that's very fertile in Israel. But it's also a very strategic place because it's between the mountain ranges. Here's Mount Carmel, Mount Gilboa, Mount Moriah, Mount Tabor. These are high elevations. And so this is a valley area here that made it, according to many generals in the past, a great battlefield. I think it was Napoleon who said this is the greatest of all battlefields that anyone could ever bring their warriors to. But because it was such a fertile place, it was also a major trade route. And so there was a lot of coming and going through there from the north and the south, but also a way for the invading armies to move through Israel in from the north and to the south. So it was not only a fertile place, a strategic place for growing, but it became this passageway for the armies to travel back and forth. And it was flat, again, making it a great place for battle, and the text of Scripture tells us of many battles that were brought about from this particular place. And this is evidently going to be the last place that this battle, the greatest of all battles, will take place, where Jesus will rescue his people. And it is going to be some kind of battle. The kings of the east are going to come across the Euphrates River, and they're going to come to this place, and they're going to think this is going to be a piece of cake, and the Lord's going to return right at that moment, and we're told, we've already been told, the blood will go up to the horse's bridles, and it will go as far as 200 miles. In other words, the Lord is coming with great vengeance, as his judgment is sure, and he is pouring out his wrath upon these ungodly nations. Now notice, before, though, that battle happens, we have to go into the seventh bowl. And by the way, just as a little, another footnote, this will be further explained in the next couple chapters. So we're kind of just getting a preview of all of this right now. Notice this worldwide leveling of the earth here in seven, verses 17 through 21. Verse 17, so the seventh angel pours out his bowl upon the air. Now some people, and rightly so, I think, I mean, this could very well be the case. According to Ephesians 2, we're told that the, Satan is the prince of the power of the air, right? And so it very well could be, as some have said, that this bowl being poured out upon the air is an attack against Satan's final rule. That seems very logical. Again, as the prince of the power of the air, maybe the Lord is saying to 
John that there's coming a time where this final judgment will be against Satan himself as this last plague and cleansing basically the whole world of Satan's influence. And that's, again, very possible. But I don't think it fits very well with what we know coming in the context of Scripture because after the millennial reign of Christ, Satan will be released back onto the earth for a short time to wield his influence once again. So don't think that's what that particular plague is about. It could be, but I don't think so if you look at it in the logical flow of the context. It seems better that this plague is against just what it says. It's against the earth's atmosphere, against the air. Now think with me. God has attacked everything that's sensitive to humanity, has he not? Everything that he has created has now been attacked except for the one last thing, oxygen, the air that men breathe. Now tell me, how important is air? Let's ask Bo the question. Forgive me, Bo, I know he won't mind, but he's sitting here with his oxygen tank. He's on oxygen 24-7 now. You think oxygen is important to Bo? Pretty important, isn't it, brother? Oxygen is the one thing that we all have to have, isn't it? We can deal with sores. We can put up with blood in the water. We can put up with all kinds of devastation for a while. But we can't breathe very long without oxygen. And so the Lord, I believe, affects and attacks the very breath that every man believe, uh, breathes. But again, I don't want to stretch that too much. We have to kind of leave it right there because we're not sure. I'm not sure. We just have to suffice it to say that every single thing that God has created for man to enjoy has now become a vehicle of judgment. He has turned everything around because he's going to replace it all, praise his name. And John, as he hears this, not only is he seeing this poured out, but notice what he hears. He hears a loud voice coming out of the temple from the throne saying, it is done. Now, as we learned earlier in the chapter, God is the only one in the temple, so it must be God with this loud authoritative vo voice shouting, it is finished. And can you imagine the joy in John as he hears the final plague is done? Finally, finally there's a breather. Finally, God is satisfied. Finally, the judgment is over. And I was trying to figure out a way to associate this for you as an illustration. And the only thing that I could help you with is that uh, when we go to the gym, part of the workout program is what they call a WOD, a W-O-D. It's an acronym for a workout of the day. And they're not very long. Some of them are five minutes, some of them are 10, some last 20, some last 30 minutes. But I can assure you with this old man's body that when that wad is over, I am so glad to hear the guy count down three, two, one, and you're done. And you fall out on the floor hoping that you can gas, grab your next breath. I'm just thinking through that and thinking of the emotion that must be coming as you hear, really, Lord? It's done? It's really done? You mean I'm not going to wake up tomorrow and feel the effects of this sinful world anymore? It's done. It's done forever. The satisfaction of God has been met. The requirements have been paid. And it is all done. But notice the effects from this judgment. John says, as he concludes this, there were flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder. Well, flashes and lightning of thunder, excuse me, flashes of lightning and thunder could simply be from the effects of the atmosphere being affected, right? As the molecules are interchanging one another, that's what lightning comes from. That's what thunder comes from. But I think it's best to see this really as a reference to God's presence, and that's very clear in the text of Scripture from Exodus 19. You'll remember, so it came about on the third day when it was morning that there was thunder and lightning flashes and a thick cloud upon the mountain and a very loud trumpet sound so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. Ezekiel chapter 1 verse 13, In the midst of the living beings there was something that looked like burning coals of fire, like torches darting back and forth among the living beings. The fire was bright and lightning was flashing from the fire. 
And then, of course, just to speak of his awesome majesty in Revelation 11, and the temple of God which is in heaven was opened, and the ark of his covenant was appeared, excuse me, appeared in his temple, and there were flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder and an earthquake and a great hailstorm. But remember with me now, all of those references were for the people of God, God's own people, to see the glory and the majesty of himself. But that's not what this is for. This is so that the ungodly will know this is the Lord. It's one thing for God's people to look into the heavens and say, Praise you, Father, because you are the God of all of this. It's another thing for the ungodly to say, This surely must be the God of those Christians. It will be certain doom for them. And notice, in addition to this thunder, as was mentioned in Revelation 11, John announces an earthquake. We know what earthquakes are. That's the shifting of those plates underneath the surface. We've been in those before. We felt the tremors here even. Had some pretty significant ones a couple years ago, right? When our neighbor's chimney fell all the way to the ground, our chimney on our house twisted completely. When we were living down in, uh, in the area close to where it was, the Louisa School was closed, you remember? From the effects of that earthquake. Just recently, Alaska had that almost eight magnitude. I mean, it's incredible. Each, if I'm correct, and you correct me if I'm wrong, but isn't each magnitude number on the scale a hundred times greater than the previous one? Isn't that what it is? Something like that? So a three or is great, a hundred times greater than a, a two? It's really significant. Well, here, Alaska just had an eight. Well, what we're told here is this is an earthquake that's across the entire world. It's almost as if you, and I wish I had a globe up here, but you can, in your mind, picture God holding the world in his hands and just pow thumping the earth as it ricochets off of that part of the world. And we've seen that in Scripture. In fact, during the time of the crucifixion, Matthew 27, Jesus cried out with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And notice, and the earth shook and the rocks were split. It's like, pow, feel that. My son has been crucified. Matthew 28, at the resurrection... After the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to the grave, and behold, a severe earthquake had occurred. For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled away the stone and sat upon it. The Lord said, pow, feel that. But again, beloved, nothing's going to compare to this earthquake. Listen again in verse 18 of chapter 16. There was a great earthquake. Okay, that sounds pretty intense. How intense is that? Well, let's look such as there has not been or had not been since man came to be upon the earth. So great an earthquake was it and so mighty. And he'll pull that more into verse 19. I just envision in my mind, not only is the Lord thumping the earth, but now he's going, take that. Well, that's my face. I don't know that God's going to do that or not. But shaking the entire world, foretold even by the prophets that this was going to be the case. God has not left his warning out. Haggai, chapter 2, verse 6, For thus says the Lord of hosts, Once more in a little while I am going to shake the heavens and the earth, the sea, and also the dry land. Speaking of this final day. The writer of the Hebrews in chapter 12, And his voice shook the earth. But now he has promised, saying, Yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heaven. There's coming a day. Peter talked about in 2 Peter chapter 3, The day of the Lord will come like a thief in which the heavens will pass away with a roar and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat. There's the sun, right? And the earth and its works will be burned up. Skip down to verse 12. Looking for the hastening of the coming of the day of the Lord because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the elements will melt with intense heat. And just so you know, although God is not going to pour out any more judgments. He is going to sign his name upon this last one in a way that will be felt that man has never felt before beyond the earthquake. But this earthquake is so powerful, verse 19 tells us that the great city was split into three parts and the city of the nations fell. Now what great city is this? Some have said this is Babylon. I don't think so. That's coming in the next chapters, 17 and 18, of the destruction of Babylon. Although it's being referred to here as a great place, I don't think it's the same place because the great Babylon is mentioned next. So what city is this? 
Well, this has to be Jerusalem because this is no other place in Scripture referred to as a great city. In Revelation 8, 11, we're told, you remember when the two witnesses were killed? Specifically, we are told that it would be in the place where the Lord was killed. Well, that's Jerusalem, that great city, verse 8 of 11 would say. And so this earthquake evidently is going to split Jerusalem into three parts. It's going to be an amazing thing. And you say, well, what three parts? Well, isn't it just like God to tell us? If we go back to Zechariah chapter 14, beginning in verse 4, notice this. In that day, and that's always a reference to the final day of judgment, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which is in front of Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives will be split in its middle from east to west by a very large valley, so that half of the mountain will move toward the north and the other half towards the south. And skip with me down to verse 8. And in that day, living waters will flow out of Jerusalem, half of them toward the eastern sea and the other half toward the western sea. It will be in summer as well as in winter. And the Lord will be king over all the earth in that day. The Lord will be the only one and his name the only one. All the land will be changed into the plain from Geba to Ramon, south of Jerusalem. But Jerusalem will rise and remain on its site from Benjamin's gate as far as the place of the first gate to the corner gate and from the tower of Hananel to the king's wine presses. And that's a reference to what they would have understood in Zechariah's day about the way the, the setting was set up in Jerusalem. But just understand that this earthquake is going to cause the city of Jerusalem to have a new valley running east to west. So if you remember in that map just a moment ago, the idea is, is that the water is going to flow from the city down through this fertile area into the Mediterranean and out the other way going uh, east, either to the Dead Sea or maybe even further. And it's going to be that way throughout the seasons. In other words, this is going to be a lasting thing that the Lord does. Isaiah 35 says it's going to be such that the desert is going to bloom with flowers. It's going to be an incredible thing. And Jerusalem will be the highest point, a new glorious city, just like the Lord has promised. Now, if you remember, there was an earthquake in Jerusalem earlier in chapter 11. That was for the judging of the ungodly. We saw that earlier. But this earthquake is going to make a beautiful change to the earth. The entire earth is going to be affected and Jerusalem. God again is going to lift up Jerusalem as he lays waste all of the world around it. Well, I can only picture in my mind as this picture of this bowing down to the holy city of God as he comes to plant his feet and to establish his throne on the world forever. And then we're told very shortly here, and just briefly mention this, that Babylon the Great was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of his fierce wrath. You remember Babylon was that city that was founded by Nimrod way back in Genesis chapter 10. It was that same place of the Tower of Babel, that site of that great pagan worship that built that edifice to the heavens, so to speak, and God raised it to the ground because Nimrod thought he was better than God and he scattered the people and created the different languages and tribes. The point here, though, as much as Babylon was this leading pagan worship city, it will be once again. God is going to raise it up to be just that wicked again. It's going to be restored to be that. We see that in Revelation 14, verse 8. But it's also possible that because of her immorality, that Babylon is going to be the headquarters of the Antichrist. There's some thought about that. And that the world is going to be seduced by him to follow Satan. Well, we've already covered that. And so we're told here in chapter 16 that God is going to destroy that city because of its influences. Again, we're going to see all this in the next chapters. But not just the city. The point is that he will destroy all that it is being affected by. Politically, socially, economically, spiritually especially. God will bring it to its knees. Because Satan will no longer have control over the world, God is leaving nothing for Satan to use in his work. His fierce wrath is being poured out on that city because he remembers all that has been done to his people, is what John says. And notice now in verse 20, every island fled away because of this earthquake. In other words, all the islands are flattened. The mountains are flattened. Imagine that for just a minute. Those of you that have seen the Alps, 
You've seen the Himalayas, Blue Ridge Mountains, the Rockies, all of those completely laid waste. Everything is gone. Nothing but gently rolling hills, as one commentator said, the Lord taking the world back to the way she once looked before he enacted judgment in the days of the flood, except for Jerusalem lifted high and holy above all. What a beautiful, beautiful picture. Now again, as I said a moment ago, God is not quite done. So in verse 21, look what he signs his name at the bottom of the page. And huge hailstones, about a hundred pounds each, came down from heaven upon men. As if to say, almost in my mind, take that. As he just pummels the earth with hail. You say, that's no big deal. I've been in hail storms, storms before. I've been pelted by those things. I've, I've seen the kind of damage they do, but it's not that big of a deal. It's, well, if you've ever watched some of the videos, you can see that it is a huge deal. Windshields are broken out. Cars are damaged. Houses are beaten to death. And it can be hugely effective. But just to help you understand the magnitude of this, the Lord tells us here, at least in our English translation, it says 100 pounds. Now, I don't know if you can visualize that or not, but that's about the size of an NFL football. Or about the weight, and get this now. In fact, let me just read this for you. The largest recorded hailstone ever fell on July 23, 2010, just eight years ago, in Vivian, South Dakota. It measured 8 inches in diameter, side to side, across. 18.6 inches around. But get this, it only weighed 1.93 pounds. Now let me see, I think we got a picture of this, don't we, Andrea? Here's the actual hailstone. I'm sorry you can't quite see that, but here's one side over here. Here's the other side. Here's the measuring the circumference of this thing. Okay, now that's big. That's the largest ever recorded. But in this day, God is going to pummel the entire earth with 100-pound hailstones. Now, the word in Greek is a word for like a talent. You've heard that in the Bible. And so it can range anywhere from about 90 to 135 pounds, depending on the context. Now, I don't know about you, but that's a big chunk of ice. They have these balls at the gym that are made out of rubber. They have sandbags, and they're 100 pounds. And one of the things that you do with it is you bend down in a squatted position, and you pick it up, and you th carry like this, and you throw your hips like that and fling it over your shoulder. And that's pretty challenging, 100 pounds. Well, imagine that puppy slamming down to the earth from the upper atmosphere upon everything that man has created. God just kind of dips his pen and says, now just so you understand who's really in charge, this is me. This is me. And you say, surely, by now, men would repent. Verse 21 ends with, but men blaspheme God because of the plague of the hail. Because its plague was extremely severe. Can you imagine going out and shaking your fist at the Lord because he has done all of this? Blaming him for the troubles that he has enacted? And we step back and as we even say those words, we start to realize that, gosh, I wonder how many times I've blamed God. I wonder how many times I've blamed God for the things that were really my fault. You see, God is never the problem, is he? We are always the problem. But we come with all kinds of reasons as to why God is the one who needs to be blamed. Beloved, that's, that's the, this what we're reading here is the epitome of what will happen in humanity in those days. God will be so much the problem in the deluded, confused mind, warped, satanic mind, that even these things will not be convincing. And what that tells me also is that people will not be convinced by signs. 
Signs in the Bible have been simply designed by God to point to him. But do you remember the story in Luke 16, the rich man and Lazarus, where Lazarus is the poor beggar who humbles himself before Abraham and goes to be with him. But the rich man was that proud man who had everything in this life and he's cast into hell when he dies. And he realizes once he's there that he's in the pit of torment of these raging flames. And he says to Abraham, Father Abraham, if it's not possible for me to go out and to speak the truth to my brothers, go send message from the, somebody to go back and tell them. And Abraham's response is, no, it's not going to work. Even if somebody comes back from the dead, they will not believe. Well, how are they going to believe is almost the response that you hear from this rich man. And the response, and that's not in the text, I'm saying that, but what really comes from that is, as Abraham says, they have the prophets, they have the law, let them hear that. Beloved, the reality is this. These words in this book are what God has given to us as the mechanism and the avenue of escape. This is what we have from the Lord. We don't need signs. We don't need miracles. We don't need proofs outside of what God has done. He has written his word, preserved it for thousands of years, told us what's coming, and supported it all the way through history. What we need to do is to humble ourselves and believe what God has already said and surrender to him before it's too late. The psalmist said, and I'll close with this, Psalm 95, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Today. You don't need a sign. Folks, listen, I don't need to drive an Abram's tank up here on the stage to convince you to show you some kind of exciting thing. I don't need to do dry ice and I don't need to be all of these hoop jumpers to convince you that God is real. God has given you everything you need to know and it's right there in your hands. It's called the Bible. And he says, read it and believe. Trust me. Literally, he says, if you will confess with your mouth and you believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord and he has been resurrected, you will be saved. You will be saved. Saved from what, Lord? Well, let's just use the last one. Giant hundred-pound hailstones pummeling the earth. How about that? That's a good thing to be saved from, isn't it? Not to mention an eternal damnation in the pit of hell which we'll talk about later. Amen? All right. Let's praise the Lord in prayer. And Father, we do. We praise you. Because you have humbled our hearts. You have helped us to see that we are not God, but you are. And so we worship you today. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. As we saw in verse 15, this little nestled section in there of your blessings to keep our clothes on to be prepared because you come like a thief Lord perhaps today would even be that day before we even get home today you would call us home and this judgment would begin but I pray that any soul that's in the sound of my voice today would come to the truth even now and listen to the psalmist today today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Lord, open the darkest heart, we pray. Do your work. There's nothing that man can do, for your word is efficient. And so, Lord, we leave this to you and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, girls.